Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've had a good day. Um, and welcome to our evening service this evening. Um, to those who watch on YouTube later on as well, as visitors, we pray that you'll be blessed as you join us. Uh, tonight we've got a visiting speaker again. It's our brother Sidney Elliott, the second in his series. He's going to talk about Psalm 23. And uh, we enjoyed him last week, and hopefully, uh, again this week, we we'll look forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, but before we do anything, let's just pray and welcome God amongst us, and then we're going to sing a couple of hymns um, before we hand over to Sydney. So let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to meet again this evening across the airwaves. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless our time together. Lord, that you would be exalted amongst us, that you would, uh, you would encourage us and equip us, and uh, that, Lord, you would teach us, train us in your righteousness, we pray, as we look at your word later on. We thank you, Lord, again for this day. Thank you for all your provision for us, Lord, in it. And we continue to pray, Lord, that you would bless us through this evening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's sing together our first hymn, shall we? It's great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, about a God who, where there is no shadow of turning, where nothing changes with him, and he's totally and utterly reliable and faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's sing that together, shall we? shadow of turning with thee thou changest not thy compassions they fail not as thou hast been the forever wilt be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand have provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me time and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me 
great hymn, lovely hymn. Let's sing our second hymn. It's one we learnt last week um, about his mercy being more. His mercy is more. Our sins, which are many, but his mercy is more. So let's sing that together tonight again. The words, I've sent you an email this afternoon. I apologise this morning's service if you got if you didn't get an email for that. Uh, but this afternoon, and sorry, this evening service, you should have got an email with the words on for this one again. Let's sing it together and join together as we uh, as we worship the Lord with this wonderful hymn. <laughs> Okay, it's time to look at God's Word together now, and it's a great again to welcome our brother Sydney Elliott with us to uh, speak for us again this evening. So, Sydney, over to you. It must have been eight years ago when Caleb, our youngest son, went to Auschwitz, and it made a lasting impression on him. The railway track, the gas chambers, the photos, and the shoes thousands of shoes, so many children's shoes, 
I think that moved him most. At the end of the day they had a time of remembrance and they read Psalm 23. I've been to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum just outside Jerusalem, the huge memorial hall and people standing there weeping, some wailing, thinking of parents, grandparents that they'd lost. And again, at the end of each day, they have a time of remembrance and they do the same. They read Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is special, precious to every Jew. Of course, it's part of the Hebrew hymn book it's the songbook of the Old Testament. Penned by David, the shepherd boy, come king. It's his personal testimony, his God story. Years before, on the hillside looking after his dad's sheep, now as an old man with the benefit of hindsight, he looks back and says, where I was to my sheep, God's been to me a million times more. This has been called the shepherd's psalm. It really should be called the sheep's psalm because it's as if David gets down on all fours and views life from the level of one of his sheep. Don't forget it's part of a trilogy Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24 are messianic psalms. Psalm 22, the cross. Psalm 23, the crook. Psalm 24, the crown. Psalm 22, the good shepherd dying for the sheep. Psalm 23, the chief shepherd leading the sheep. Psalm 24, the great shepherd ruling and reigning and returning for his sheep. Basically, the whole sweep of God's salvation story ahead of time. A thousand years before Jesus came, it's all about him rescuing, rising, reigning and returning. David refers to God as the Lord in capitals. It's Jehovah. So sacred was the name of Jehovah that no Jew ever dared allow the name to cross their lips. In fact, only the high priest once a year went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and he whispered the name Jehovah. But here David exclaims and proclaims the Lord Jehovah, the covenant God, the holy God, is my shepherd. Not back there in the dim and distant past. It's up to date. It's an ongoing reality. He is my shepherd. It's a personal, individual relationship that David has with God. And the verse ends with, I shall not want. When we get older, we tend to downsize. We go through things and throw things. And we keep what's essential and get rid of the rest. Well, David downsizes and he has all he ever needs in him. That's what we all look for and long for, isn't it? Satisfaction. According to David, that's only found in a relationship with God. And again, Psalm 23 is written from an Old Testament perspective. From a New Testament perspective, the shepherd is who? The shepherd is Jesus. He's who we need. He's all we need. Soul satisfaction found in Jesus Christ. He's our shepherd, our sufficient shepherd. Today, because the Lord is my shepherd, everything else flows from that. The rest follows on from that. Verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. As you can see, I'm trying to keep to the theme, green pastures, and over here, a babbling brook. So grab your cap 
grab your coat if you have some boots that would be good as well and let's head out to the farm let's head out to the field although many modern day shepherds modern day sheep farmers use drones and quad bikes to check on their sheep and they drive their sheep instead of leading their sheep so we need to step further back and think Bible times and place ourselves in David's shoes in his shepherd's sandals and the first picture he paints is one of of rest here's this boy from Bethlehem and there's not much for sheep to eat in the stifling heat just a few patches here and there and so the shepherd would take his flock onto the pasture land to the luscious green grass still covered with early morning dew so they can eat away to their hearts content but as the sun gets higher and stronger it's time for them to rest to lie down that's important for their health and for their well-being of course sheep are easily startled it's scared very quickly any little noise and off they go and they become terribly restless I have a book written by someone called Philip Keller not Tim Keller but Philip Keller he was a shepherd before he was a pastor and from his experience with his flock with his sheep he tells us that sheep need to be free from certain things if they're ever going to rest they need to be free from friction they're social creatures there's a hierarchy in the flock and if there's any friction at all they can't relax and they need to be free from flies flies come and lay their eggs and the eggs hatch and live in the nose and on their faces and cause abscesses and great discomfort and of course they need to be free from fear says Keller they feel in constant danger they're very timid and that's key if they're ever going to settle down and so the shepherd he has to deal with all of the above and only then will the sheep be at peace and settle down and what's more sheep like doing their own thing they're stubborn we'll talk more about that next week but they don't know what's good for them so sometimes the shepherd has to force the issue put his hand on their head even grab their ears and push them down make them lie down stop them in their tracks so that they can be at rest the emphasis in, in the verse is in the word make and as David remembers doing all of that for his dad's sheep he also knew that on many occasions God did that to him God had to handle him strongly and firmly and make him lie down when he wasn't willing or wanting to lie down God boxed him in by circumstances God put him in the corner as it were locked him down put him in isolation for a while in the New Testament Jesus the Good Shepherd did the very same to his disciples at points we shake our heads don't we as we listen to the disciples they have so much to learn they're full of questions they even challenge Jesus and rebuke him they give him an earful and Jesus uses different situations to stop them in their tracks to grab their attention and he has to force the issue remember on one occasion he told them to come apart and to rest a while and he took them to a deserted place and he taught them and he hammered home some key truths that they had to get hold of sometimes the good shepherd has to do that with us we're constantly on the go like the man who jumped onto the horse 
and rode off in every direction at once. Lots of noise, lots of activity, but he didn't get anywhere fast. And we're a bit like that. And we need to get off the treadmill, off the merry-go-round, and press the pause button and sit down and stop. And the shepherd has to force us to do that sometimes through sickness, maybe. What about this lockdown? He's trying to get our attention. He has something to say to us. I wonder, what's he trying to say to you? What's he doing in you? What's he teaching you? What lessons does he want you to get hold of? Some of us are stubborn sheep. And we're hard to nail down, hard to pin down. But he's got us now. But he doesn't want us just to stop for the sake of it, for the fun of it, to prove a point, because he's vindictive or he hates us. No, he loves us. He has our good in view. He wants to teach us. He wants us to grow. This is for our well-being. Matthew Henry, the old commentator, said this. God wants his saints, his people, to lie down with contentment of mind, whatever their lot is, knowing their souls are at rest in him. And that makes every pasture green. In other words, it's less about our circumstances. It's more about what God is doing in us. The interior life. And it's a supernatural thing. Paul writes to the Philippians and he speaks about anxiety. And he says, don't be anxious for anything. Rather, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And then he says this, you'll know the peace of God guarding your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And the God of peace will be with you. He will bring you to a place of peace and rest, where we find peace and rest in him. Didn't Jesus say, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. In the upper room, Jesus said to his disciples, peace be with you. They're restless sheep. They've been scattered. And here they are back together, but they're frightened. And the shepherd appears. And he wants them to come to this place of peace. And enjoy and know his peace. And that's what this psalm is all about. And other psalms, David tells us to rest in the Lord, doesn't he? I wonder, do you know that peace? Do you enjoy that sense of stillness? Can you relax? Can you rest in who he is and what he's doing and who we are in him? That's the first picture David paints. He makes me to lie down. Naturally, left to ourselves, we're always in the run. I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. No time to say hello, goodbye. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. God says, no more running from me. Start running to me and rest in me. If necessary, out of love, because I care for you, I'll make you lie down. He wants us to submit and they are fine stillness. Next, not only rest, but refreshment. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and then he leads me beside the still waters. Sheep don't like fast flowing water. Of course they don't with their woolly jumpers, they wouldn't last very long. So they stay well away from rivers with fast flowing water. The shepherd therefore has to go over, get into the river 
and pull out some rocks, pull out some boulders from the bank and create a dam and stop the flow, create a pool so that there's fresh, clean water and it's safe and still for the sheep to drink. And David says the Lord does that for his sheep. He knows they're vulnerable. He knows they're susceptible and so he takes care of them. He goes before them and sovereignly orders their circumstances. He doesn't test them beyond what they're able to bear. How kind, how compassionate is he? Again, David went through many trying and testing and difficult and dangerous times in his life. Desperately dangerous. But he knew that God had ordered all of these things. God had his finger, as it were, on the thermostat and spared him and saved him from unnecessary danger and difficulty. And yes, sometimes we're exposed to things that we'd wish them away, wouldn't we? But our shepherd is wise and he knows what we need. And all the while, behind the scenes, he has his finger on the temperature gauge. It's never off the temperature gauge. He's leading us by still waters that we might regularly get refreshment and have the assurance that he's in charge. Paul in Romans tells us all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And sometimes we repeat that verse as a bit of a platitude. No, it's in the context of growth, Christ-likeness, sanctification, masterfully, wonderfully, our God, our shepherd takes and makes and moulds us with a whole variety of things to accomplish his will in us and conform us to the image of his son. I guess when we're trusting the wisdom of the shepherd, the goodness of the shepherd, knowing that he has our good in view, our well-being at heart, that's the place that we need to be. In him making us lie down in green pastures and leading us by still waters, he wants us to be at rest and he wants us to enjoy times of refreshment. So how does this all speak into our particular situation just now? What's Psalm 23 saying to you and saying to me today? Yes, written long ago, but more up to date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. Tailor made, bang on, relevant for us, right here, right now. Isn't that true? A few weeks ago, I talked about Johnny Erickson Tada and all that happened to her. Her accident, she tells us, God used that to make her lie down, to be in that place of soul stillness and rest and peace. And all the way he's been leading her and he's brought her to cool, refreshing water. And she tells us it's not a one-off thing, it's an ongoing thing, a daily thing, a moment-by-moment -moment thing, humbling her under his mighty hand that she might follow him and his leading. Resistance and rebellion is the road to nowhere, whereas submission and surrender is the path to peace and plenty. I guess in closing the question is, do you belong to the shepherd? Do you belong to Jesus? Do you know him? Does he know you? Do you know anything of his care? 
and his kindness, his goodness and his grace. And maybe in these days you're more aware of how restless you really are. Anxieties that lie dormant come to the fore. Someone defined anxiety like this. It's a future without Jesus. And a future without Jesus is something to be anxious about. You need to come under the loving care of the shepherd. Peter tells us in one of his epistles, we've gone astray, but we have returned to the shepherd of our souls. And the only way to do that, the only way to be part of his flock, the only way that we can say the Lord is my shepherd is in the context of the trilogy that we spoke about at the start. Psalm 22, the cross. Psalm 22 comes before Psalm 23. And of course, the big context of the whole flow, the whole sweep of God's salvation story. This Psalm points to Jesus. A thousand years later, after this was written Jesus comes and he claims to be the good shepherd and here we are another 2,000 years down the line and he calls us to follow him the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters Well, thank you, Sydney, for that. That was wonderful. Um, again, a lovely reflection on the rest and peace that we have um, as the Lord, as be the Lord being our shepherd. And so great to be able to share that with you this evening. And we trust that God will bless his word to our hearts um, as we go on with our week and we go into the next week um, together. Let's sing one more hymn together, shall we, as we finish this evening. This is a new hymn for, 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 for us, maybe. Uh, it's on our playlist on YouTube, so you may well have heard it if you've listened to the prayer list. Uh, sorry, to the playlist. It's, um, it's a hymn by Keith and Christine uh, Getty, um, which talks about him, God who holds us fast. And uh, so let's sing this together. Let's, again, if you uh, join in with them and, uh, and worship the Lord. Uh, and when it's finished, that will be our service finished. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for, be, uh, for being with us. I hope the Lord has blessed you. Um, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you his peace this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing the hymn together, shall we, to close. <laughs>
justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold Thank you.